Welcome to Persons of Interest, a podcast featuring interviews with interesting people doing interesting things, diving into careers, personal stories, life lessons, and more. Here's your host, Derek Dockett. Another edition of the Persons of Interest podcast. Thank you guys so much for uh, continuing to check out the uh, podcast. Really appreciate the comments and support of folks that are taking time to listen. In this episode, really excited, as I'm always excited about my guests, because these folks don't have to take all the time in the world and when they're busy to do things. But jumping back into the sports world, another journalism guest from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He is a sports columnist. You can follow him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those things. Even does a little radio on the side, too. Too. We'll talk a little about that, but Ben Fredrickson from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Ben, thanks so much for uh, hopping on the podcast with me. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having me, man. I am honored to be dubbed a person of interest. <laughs> I'm glad to be your guest, and thanks for having me. I've, I checked out some of the other guests you've had. It seems like you've, you've got a good sports vibe going, so happy to contribute to it. I'm a big fan of sports. So I'm uh, honored to keep the sports tradition rolling on your podcast. I had, as I mentioned before we started recording, I had the other Ben from the Post on, Ben Hockman on a a while ago. So I said, boy, I had, I have a short list of folks and I said, I got to reach out to him because A, I can't just have one Ben on and not have both Ben's on with all the gifs or gifs that I've made in the past of you guys when you're doing the two Ben's in a car for the paper. But I guess my first question for you, why journalism? Oh, I thought you were going to ask why we don't do the video. <laughs> I'll get to that. Okay, all right. All right. We, can talk about that. we can talk about that later. Why journalism? I think it's a question that my parents are probably still asking themselves, as in, why didn't you pick something else? But no, I make that joke with a, with an asterisk. I always, I think anyone who's in our field has had those moments where they're a young journalist or they're in college or high school and the old person comes and tells that joke about, I'll give you a tip about journalism, find something else to do. And everybody <laughs> right. rolls their eyes. And I know I, I always felt that way. For me, it was a decision. I don't even know if it was a decision. It was something I felt pulled toward in high school. I always liked reading and writing. I had a fantastic high school journalism teacher. I took the class as an elective in high school, the high school newspaper class. And uh, I was born and raised in Sedalia, Missouri. We had a high school newspaper called, this is really creative, Tiger Tales. I took the class. I'm sure it was probably because I thought a girl in the class was cute or something. It was not because (laughs) I was dying to do journalism. But she gave us an assignment and it was to go and find something around the school that caught our eye, something we were interested in. And we didn't know at the time why we were doing that. So we we went and explained, hey, this is something that caught my eye, I didn't know much about. And then she said, okay, now here's your assignment, go find out about it, go talk to people about why it's there, what it means, and write about what you've learned. And for me, it was in the gym, which is where I spent a lot of time. I played all kinds of different sports in high school. And it was a retired jersey in the Mm. trophy case of our of our high school. And it belonged to uh, Kim Anderson, okay. who at the time, obviously folks know Kim. He played at the University of Missouri. He uh, coached at the University of Central Missouri and later the University of Missouri, a great Mizzou athlete and great basketball coach. It didn't work out for him with the Tigers, but had coached to great success mm-hmm. in Warrensburg before then. He is from Sedalia and he had played at my high school and they had retired his uniform. And I knew this idea that we had this great player from my hometown who'd gone on to been a good coach, but didn't know that much else about him. And through a part of this first reporting assignment, I remember I I called at the time the University of in Warrensburg, Central Missouri, and I actually ended up talking to Kim Anderson, which was I guess was my first ever interview. And I thought, what a cool thing to be able to find something that you think is neat And then to be able to say, I want to find out more about that. And then to just make a series of phone calls. And next thing you're talking to someone who who this thing was from. And you're finding out the story from the source about his basketball career, about his time growing up in Sedalia. Kim was great. 
ended up telling me about how he had been on the newspaper staff when he was in, hmm. in high school. He has been done similar things. And it was cool to share that story with him again years later. I think it was at SEC Media Days. And it was a neat moment. But it was really that kind of led me into this thing of this this is fun. Ended up writing for my hometown newspaper, the Sedalia Democrat. By the time I had graduated high school, doing like an inside look at our football team, which I played on. And then, of course, was blessed to live an hour away from the University of Missouri, where they've got a really good journalism school. I did not belong there, but I got in and they didn't realize that I didn't belong there until I had been able to do some things. So <laughs> that was great. You go to the class and you're asking around, OK, where's everybody from? And it's like Dallas, Chicago, New York City, L.A. And I'm like, I'm from Sedalia. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's just about an hour down the road. And so that was when I knew, all right, this is serious. I, I got a good thing here, a good opportunity. So don't mess it up. And I tried not to. Yeah, yeah. You've uh, turned it into an impressive career and still got a lot of time ahead of you. After Mizzou, you've spent some time in Knoxville, Tennessee. I guess the first big boy job there. Tell me about the experience there covering the Vols and everything else there in Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee was not my first okay. job in journalism, but it was it was one that was probably, it was where I was before I came back to St. St. Louis. Louis. Gotcha. And Tennessee was great, man. I loved living in Knoxville and really enjoyed my time there. Met my wife there. Uh, it was a very formative place for me in my career with the guys I worked with down there at the Knoxville News Sentinel. At the time, it was, it had really The amount of experience that was there at the paper with some of the writers I got to be around was remarkable. Guys who had been doing the job at a high level for decades. And to be able to hang out with them and learn from them, I felt like I was it was a blessing to be able to be down there. And I learned so much from that group of guys that I was able to carry with me and will forever. My first job, my first real job in journalism outside of college, the things Mm -hmm. I did while I was in school was at the uh, Casper Star Tribune in in Wyoming. Okay. So it was in the newspaper was based in Casper, Wyoming, which is the at the time was the biggest newspaper in Wyoming, which is ironic because it's the largest newspaper in the state with the fewest people. <laughs> uh, so I lived in Laramie, Wyoming, which is where the University of Wyoming was. And I covered University of Wyoming sports and it was football, it was basketball. It was wrestling and whatever else, you know, was on the college beat. That was an introduction to the job. I had done some interning and done some things at the Post-Dispatch in college. And I had obviously had my final internship had been in Las Vegas where I thought, do I want to do sports? Do I not? I'd interned at the Post-Dispatch before I left Mizzou and had a great experience. And thank God for that, because I got to meet a lot of the guys I work with today and also got a chance to make a first impression on the newspaper, which you never know how something like that's going to work out. And I managed to not screw it up too bad. And it got me on the list of potential candidates to return later. So that was a huge, huge break for me being the Rick Hummel intern way back in 2011, the summer of 2011. You make me Um, feel old. Quick story about (laughs) that, though. Yeah, I know. I was a junior in college at the time and I covered the Cardinals as the Hummel intern that summer. You got to work up to covering the Cardinals. So my last few assignments were out at the ballpark. And I'll never forget folks who obviously remember the 2011 season very well will remember right that summer, Albert Pujols got hurt. It was that game against the Royals. He's running down the first base and there was a play at the bag and he he hurt his wrist, I think. And he was going to be injured and the Cardinals were not playing well. And I left to go back to Mizzou. And I remember my dad saying, how do you think they got a chance? And I think I said something like, no chance. The season's over. Forget about it. <laughs> and it was, of course, 2011 where they back in and find a way to take off and win it all. And my dad likes to remind me of that. You know, about any time I think I know something about sports, <laughs> he reminds me of the time I wrote off the 2011. <laughs> Try to keep that in mind that you really, as much as we roll our eyes sometimes about people saying the season's not over yeah. until it's over, it really isn't. So I tried to learn that lesson there. But to not get too distracted, when I was in Wyoming, it came after I did an internship in Las Vegas. And I did the, I was wrestling. Do I want to do sports? Do I want to get out? So I did, a, I had options when I graduated from Mizzou. And one was covering high school sports down in Georgia, which was a big deal because it's high school football down there is huge. And I thought, okay, well, this is a paper that Maybe I could work up to covering Auburn or work up to covering Georgia or see, get my foot in kind of some SEC action if I go down there and work hard. And the other option was to be an intern at the Las Vegas Review Journal. And the beat was crime and breaking news. Oh. 
in Las Vegas. <laughs> so he's young. I don't have family or anything. I also spend a summer in Las Vegas and uh, covering crime and breaking news, which you learn pretty quickly. Like anybody who's covered hard news knows that the police scanner is a big deal. Right. That's how you find out about a lot of stories. So in most cities, when you're covering that stuff, if you hear, hey, there's been a a carjacking or there's been a some sort of bad event. Okay, there's threats of a of violence at this location at a business. You rush out and write about it or see, okay, what's the commotion? In Vegas it would be, okay, there's been a fight at this address, police are on the way, and I'd go to the editor, I'd say, You want me to go cover that? And they'd say, No, no, just wait. They'll just wait, see what comes next. And the next call would there's been a car stolen here and blah blah, blah. So just wait. I thought, Am I ever gonna cover, actually write anything? And like the next call always would be like yeah, there's a man running down the strip half naked with a battle axe, and he just flipped over every table at the all-you-can-eat buffet <laughs> of, of ribs, and now he's it looks like he's headed to the strip club. And like they'd be like, yeah, go cover that. <laughs> so, <laughs> just cover the most crazy stuff. Like as an intern, and you're asking people about these ridiculous events, and you really learned at that time. I learned asking hard questions after that wasn't that hard. Yeah, I bet. I kind of learned, and on a very serious note, covered some tragic stuff too. And having to interview family members who've lost Mm -hmm. people and things like that, it really, in a good way, makes asking questions that in the sports world can feel really hard, not that hard. If you can ask a mother what it's like to cope with the loss of a child, um, then you don't have a hard time asking a manager why he made that decision with the lineup before a playoff game. And now there's a way to do it. And I try to ask questions that get good answers, not questions that show how tough I am. But uh, sometimes you have to ask some prickly things. And that, not that I did it for that long, but that period of time in the summer in Las Vegas, A, showed me that you got to do it. And B, it showed me that I didn't want to do that forever. Yeah. That I miss sports. I like the aspect of sports, the storytelling aspect, and that there's just some stuff that it's important to cover, but I didn't want to make a career out of it. And you do enough, you do a lot of hard news in sports. I know that you're in the sports world that you see there's guys who can't do or won't do hard news in sports, but there's a lot of hard news in sports. There's crime, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. there's breaking news, there's ups and downs, and you got to be, in our world, you got to be able to do all of it. So that helped me. And then I went out to Wyoming, which was, was really great experience. I didn't know anybody, I showed up and I just had a, I lived in a little converted motel about half a mile from the basketball and football arenas there. And it was like literally in the parking lot of an Arby's. And I'll never forget that because I smelled curly fries are like triggering for me. The smell of like Arby's curly fries because I'd smelled that every day. Oh man. In this motel I converted. It was an apartment, but it had been a motel. Yeah. And the, it was brutal, man. Like, the smell probably like, just kicked in. in. Yeah. Like, <laughs> It was, it was a great experience, but I'm very glad to not be living there anymore. <laughs> the, the beat was great because it, people might remember this. I don't know. I mean, not, I'm not saying people would, were following Wyoming sports that will be listening to your podcast, but they may remember at the time. It was right around the time I was there. I covered it when Dave Christensen, the former <laughs> new offensive coordinator, he was the head coach out there. Yep. And remember, he had that viral. This was back when Deadspin was huge. He had that viral rant against Troy Calhoun, the Air Force coach, on Military Appreciation Day because he thought Air Force was faking injuries. And he had this epic rant that the Air Force football team video team somehow recorded and released. And it was this big drama. He got fined and it made national news. I was out there covering all of that. So it was a chaotic time for Wyoming sports. They had a basketball player who got in in some trouble off the court. And it was a significant story because they had been unbeaten to start the season. So it was a lot of coverage of mixing hard news and also just learning how to work a beat and to fill that grind and keep people informed about a team. So I should have stayed there longer, but I left after, I think I was there maybe a year, a little bit more, came back to St. Louis when they were, back then they had the Fox Sports regional thing jobs. And they came back to just as that was starting to shut down and realized that it wasn't going to be around. And that's when I went to Knoxville okay. and I actually planned on being there pretty much for the long haul, but got a chance to come back to St. Louis and could not turn that down. Yeah. My plan is to be done moving. That's, yeah. That's- <laughs> Nice. So here in St. Louis, you're a columnist. So for folks that sort of started out by saying journalism, you're writing columns and 
it's different than working the beat because you give your opinion. And I'm curious, when you write an article, and I'm prefacing this with asking you about the Missouri State piece you wrote, because I remember when Missouri State football made the hire. Oh, gosh, it seems like it's been forever ago. I guess it's been the last three years, four years. You came back recently and wrote a follow-up piece saying, wow, did Petrino, you tip your cap, pretty much. You tipped your cap in, in, in the writing. Is it tough to write and give your opinion? And when you write you, in this social media world, you see the responses and people aren't tacking, but you're giving your opinion. And sometimes you have to take things with a grain of salt. How difficult is it to be a col- columnist ver- and give your opinion, write thought-provoking things versus reporting, working the beat? It's a great question. And it can, first and foremost, you got to have a thick skin. And I think that's whether you're in the industry as a columnist, as a beat reporter, as a broadcaster, because these days, if if people don't like you, they've got a million different ways to let you know. Email, phone call, Twitter, social, whatever. (laughs) And that's fine. It comes along with the job. We are... I, I, we're not celebrities, but we are in some ways public figures. And if you don't have a, if you don't have an ability to weather that, then it's not going to be very comfortable yeah. experience because you do hear from people who love what you do at times or who appreciate something. But it seems like you hear a lot more from people who are not liking something. And I think that's just the nature of the Internet in a lot of ways. You certainly see athletes deal with it and they deal with it on a much higher level than media members. So the first thing is you got to have a thick skin. And if you don't, then you got to find something else to do because you're not going to be having very much fun. I handle it as I, I think reporting is a big part of writing columns. You want to show people a lot of what you write is here's what I think and why. The why is going to be the reporting. It can't just be, I think that the Cardinals should sign this free agent because I like him. Right. That means that you can, but that's not a very compelling argument. You want to try to prove here are the reasons I think this right. person is the right fit for this team, or here's the reason I thought that coaching was decision was a mistake or was smart. Here's why I think Ali Marmol is getting too much heat for this when the attention should be over there, any number of things. And the, what hopefully backs that up is the reporting. People you've talked to, numbers you've crunched, things you've, you have observed, experiences you have that you can compare and contrast to. So I do think that's a part of it, at least for me, a big part of it. I think also part of it is saying here's what I think, here's why. And also saying, or maybe not saying, but understanding my role 90, 99% of the time is to say, here's what I think and why, hopefully give you something to think about. Ideally, maybe you agree with it, but also start that conversation. And part of the fun of this is knowing that people might disagree yeah. and say, what about that? And you can say, what about this? And it doesn't always have to be an argument, but I don't want people just to always read something I write and go, yeah, okay. Because that's really not the goal. You want to make him say, hell yeah, or I don't know about that, or maybe I don't agree, but I see where he's coming from. I mean, you can aim for all kinds of different things, but you want to elicit some sort of a response, not necessarily skip Bayless, hot taking for sure. the sake, but creating some sort of a dialogue, make people think a little bit. That's got to be a part of the job. Not every column is the same. Sometimes that's a cool thing I like about doing what I do is, I can write a column saying this is a mistake and I can get fired up one day. And then the (laughs) next day I can say, hey, this is something that maybe more people need to be paying attention to. Or I can throw a complete curveball. One of the favorite things I write every year is I write about the the high school kids who won the uh, the sportsmanship award from the uh, sports commission, the Musial group. And it's one of my favorite things to write every year because we cover so much just minutia at times. We cover so much thing. We cover a lot of entitled athletes. We cover some athletes who are awesome too. Don't get me wrong. Some of the pros are legitimately some of the greatest people and do great things. But these high school kids who are like, my God, like there's so much hope for the future. That's one of my favorite things to write every year. So I like the unpredictability of it. And I like being able to bounce around to every different sport that's going on. I like being able to be at spring training and then at a college football game and then at a hockey game. And then that to me is fun, being able to move around a little bit. And then I think the last part of it, to get specifically to the thing you asked about with the Petrino column, part of this job, I think, is being authentic. You've got to A, be around. And if you have strong opinions, you got to be around so people who you're writing about can say, hey, that's wrong. Or here's what I hear. You got to be present. You got to be accountable. 
with the people you write about and cover if you want to be taken seriously long term. So I think being around, I also think being willing to admit when you're wrong. It's easy to celebrate your wins. I mean, it's easy to say, hey, look, I thought the Cardinals should go get Wilson Contreras. Thought he was a great fit. They got him. I'm so smart. I'm the best. It's not easy to say, hey, I, re- I made, I didn't, I don't think I made fun of it, but I questioned the Bobby Petrino hire when Missouri State made it. Yeah. And multiple seasons in, it had worked. Now, you can make the case that it didn't work because he left, but they knew he was going to leave. Kyle Motes, the AD down there, told me he's going to leave at some point. And the goal is to prove to people that we can win here, and that will make it easier to win again when he's gone. And I thought, let's well, when you say it like that's that makes sense. And when you haven't won in so long and a guy came in there and did it, now I'm sure they didn't want him to leave to go be the offensive coordinator at UNLV, but he was only there for a week and now he's gone again. So Bobby Petrino has elements of him that clearly can make can be polarizing. Right. And the idea that he's always going to be looking for the next best thing, I think Missouri State was okay with that. But clearly their hire of him worked for what they were trying to get to. And I felt because I had been critical of it, it was time for me to circle back and say, hey, you know, and I, that's how I presented the interview. I told him, I said, I did this. I want to come down and, and not write. It's not about me. And a lot of people felt that way when that hire was made. Here's why it's working for now. And that's I felt like was a story that deserved to be told. And I think people respond well to that. Missouri State was like, yeah. Come on down. We'll show you what we have going on down here. And I appreciated that. And I think to some level they did too. So we'll see what they can do to build off of that. But that's, I think, too, is you can't ignore times where you were flat out wrong. And you don't want to be writing a column every day saying, hey, well, I was wrong about right. that, by the way, because that <laughs> that means you're wrong. Too <laughs> you're wrong. I think it does. I think readers appreciate when you hold yourself accountable in terms of that stuff, just like you would someone you're writing about. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you as a Missouri State alum, a guy that worked at the Missouri Valley Conference, sort of ingrained. I follow all things Missouri State and the original article. There were some pretty the alumni base in here in St. Louis. Obviously, it was a little bit, I guess, upset some word to use. It wasn't even a, it wasn't even an article. It was a tweet. But, the, but your point stands. And I don't actually I think we probably agree on this. To me, if you put it out there, you got to own it. Whether you sit on a radio show or you say it on Twitter yeah. or write it in a column, like that, I think everything has to be, you got to stand by everything. I've ran into this people, well, I just said that on radio. It's no, that <laughs> to the person you're talking about or the fan base that you're talking about, it, they don't care whether it's in writing or right. on radio or on Twitter. But the tweet was, I think, something along the lines of, man, to me, I thought it was at the time I was like, this is disappointing for all the people who are trying to get that job. who haven't had a chance. The up and comers, the young coaches looking for the opportunity. The guy yeah. on his, how many chances does he get? And maybe it was disappointing to those people. But here's the deal. Petrino won there. He got talent there that they were not getting before. And now they'll see if they can continue yeah. that. But for, for I thought it would blow up in their face. It didn't. And I thought it deserved to be written about why. Yeah. For folks that I know there's a many of my podcast listeners are not hardcore Missouri State folks. There are many, obviously, that know. But just for backstory, just for reference, he did have conference championship one. They made the playoffs several years. Struggled this past year, but he moved on to, obviously, UNLV. But now, I believe, Texas A&M? Texas A&M. A&M. The yeah, only guy in this whole thing who really got left at the altar and left disappointed in his Petrino experience was Barry, Barry Odom. Yeah. <laughs> Hired him for hired him at UNLV for a span of a week and a half. Yeah, he, if that he was around, he was not even around UNLV as long as Matt Holiday was the Cardinals uh, bench, bench coach. coach. Yeah, so, included zero games. So, so was, but yeah, his, his role at Missouri State, he did a job that Missouri State football had never seen in years. I'm right. someone that's seen them five and six, four and seven, three wins, two wins, zero wins. And to have playoff appearances, it's something. And now they've got an opportunity to build on that in the future with younger coaching staff there, guys that are hungry, guys that the current athletes that are there ready to move on and still improve that and get that program continuing to go in the right direction. Realizing um, that momentum, carrying it forward is going to be big for them. But yeah. I think Moat said it really when he said, you can't know what you can do until you know what can be done. There you go. Until you see some signs. And he brought them that for sure. Yeah. So they, they have a vision for the future of what can be done based on what Bobby Pertino brought them. So there you go. Back to your work at the Post, though. I mentioned Ben Hockman. You guys like to have a lot of fun. You guys like to do things a little bit differently there. And of course, 
journalism in the States, it's not just writing anymore. You've got to be on social media. You've got to use digital assets to the best of your ability. You've got to engage with listeners. You do a weekly chat. But one of my favorite things that I wish was still around was a little video segment called Two Bins. You guys would literally get into a car, drive around, and talk about sports topics. How in the world did this idea come about? I'm sure it was a, at the beginning of it. I'm sure it was a total, absolute ripoff of <laughs> what Jerry Seinfeld was doing with the comedians. And yeah. However, we were the first. I don't know if this does. Do I get to take credit? We were the first media members, and I'm using my air quotes in St. Louis. <laughs> who were driving around talking in a car. So it was sponsored that. too. It was sponsored. So it started out. Yeah. There's a whole. There's a whole story. It started out just in my. You know. Old crappy, I say crappy, right? Old crappy <laughs> yeah. Honda Ridge line truck, and we would drive around in my truck with a GoPro stuck to the windshield, and we do it once a week. And there would be occasionally we do holiday editions. There'd be costumes. We got we started getting guests. guests on. Yeah, like I, I think I had Barry Odom in the back of that thing once. And I couldn't believe the people that would agree to do it. And it kind of got a little audience. It picked up not one, but at the time it had like multiple. It had two sponsors. It, they were car dealers. Car, yeah, so, dealerships. You were having yeah, their cars. <laughs> we were in the cars of the dealerships. I don't think I'm speaking out of school here. There were some issues with a cup. With there was there was an issue with one of the cars that happened while it was not us. There was a windshield that got broken with one of the cars at one point. Not. Driving, It had been delivered. It was going to be used for the shoot. And there was an issue. And I think that had caused maybe some issues with the sponsorship. Um, I did accidentally one time kind of curb. <laughs> and I think that was repaired. Okay, though. I don't think that was a, as big of an issue. See, these are the things I didn't know. <laughs> there were a couple, no pun intended, there were a couple speed bumps on the car side. And the sponsorship ended up, came to a separation. <laughs> and died from there i've had a lot of people ask about it maybe there maybe there's a chance for it in the future i don't know i'm not closing the door on it forever but maybe there's a <laughs> maybe there's some sort of a way a way to bring it back but hockman's moved on he's left me yeah he's got a solo video project now he's got a he's got a he's got a studio so i just do my videos with gordo now in the studio there's no driving element <laughs> to it and you were the driver too i had to drive <laughs> I was going to say, was there a reason on that? Did he you not want to? You, had, you should probably ask him about why he doesn't drive. <laughs> he does drive. He didn't drive on the video. I think it was more of a directions thing. Just kidding. I'm going to tweet him now. I don't want to put him on blast. <laughs> he, should, he should answer that. We had a lot of fun. We have I have various collections of props. We had the Carlos Martinez blue Afro wig wore once. We had some Thanksgiving outfits. You guys, Travis Ford came with us. Jackie joined our Kersey, which I can't believe that she would say. I can't believe when she said yes to that. I was like, are you kidding? Me? Are you getting a vehicle with us. One of the ones, somebody we had, but we couldn't drive with. We told them we if they just sit in the car, we would do it sitting. Oh, okay. Uh, certain people had certain, which understandable. I'm sure there was like some liability. It might have also been a liability issue. I don't know. I, corporate never got involved, but uh, I, I always wondered if there might, if it was always the safest thing to do. But we had a lot of fun, yeah. and I'm glad that you enjoyed it. You actually would send us the. Now, this is a polarizing topic, the GIF or JIF. Right. But, uh, you would send us the little mini videos that we would use for Twitter. And I, you've told me that you've had – you have a folder full of multiple ones. You probably have ones that I haven't seen. <laughs> I'm going now to check the count, the number, because they're in my Dropbox now. Like, I never I, know when I, I'm going to need these. So I think because I did the – I think because the Hockman and I have done the podcast, I think we should get access to the uh, folder. Okay. If you have one with the pilgrim hat, that was Hockman's best. I don't know if I have that one. You kind of look like Bob Ross. There are 41 different <laughs> gifs or gifs. Most of them are focused on <laughs> Hockman. We did that many. Yeah, he was. He's very, as folks who've listened to both of our podcasts know, he's very animated. High energy. Yes. Animated. Yep. Uh, there are some where I captured three. Like there was the one where Derek you two and Derek Gould, you're yeah, dressed up in tuxes. <laughs> All right, yeah, we gave away our – what your, did we call your, them? I think it was your end-of-season baseball awards or something. I don't know what yeah. it was, but you were in yeah, tuxedos. We Cardinals o- se- season awards. Yeah. I had a name for them, but I can't remember. I think Gold wore a tux. Yes, all three of you did. I have a tux. Are you he's sure? A, he's in a legitimate tux. I've got you know. at least <laughs> – 
I've got a gif of Hockman, like, I don't know what he's doing in it, but Ghoul's just sitting there, what is going on in my life? He has this expression on his face. Funny, you mentioned new media and being able to do all of this video and you got to do everything. And totally right. like radio, if you're in this field now, you have to be able to communicate in all kinds of different ways. I did go back to speak to a Mizzou journalism class a couple years ago and I sent them, you know, you send them like, here's, these are the columns I think I wrote the best. These are the ones that I feel like really moved people. And I took 10 questions and the nine of them were about two Ben's videos. <laughs> there you go. It's just to show you like, you don't know people, people want different things. And I, if people liked it, I think what they liked about it was that it wasn't like super serious. We yeah. had fun. And it was different. Yeah. And maybe that's a good lesson is it, there's fun to be had and there's a there's an appetite for things that, that are different and not always so serious all the time. So sports should be fun. There you we, go. We take them seriously. We take the job seriously, but it's OK to have some fun along the way. And we certainly did. Yeah. Although I, I hope no cars were seriously <laughs> damaged. <laughs> My last question for you. You also do a little radio on the side as well. How do you enjoy that? It's a little different medium. You get to talk. You got, you actually, you and Ben had radio show of your own, but you're doing a little side stuff on KTRS. How, how do you enjoy that in, in contrast to doing your work with the Post? Yeah, I love it. We had at one time, so I guess I started doing some radio back when I first started in, in Wyoming. I did a okay. little... We did some in Knoxville. The newspaper had a radio show we would go on. So I've had some experience with it. And in St. Louis, I've we Derek and Benjamin and I had a show, shortly lived show called The Writer's Block. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Another thing that we had an absolute blast doing, it got more complicated due to travel schedules. Very rarely are the three of us in the same place at once. So it was a headache on that front. But when we were together, we had a blast. I'm sure I probably met Chris Gard, longtime radio producer. He's now former yeah, candidate for Senate, <laughs> a politician, question mark, but also a doorman. One of my best friends in the world was an usher in my wedding. That show introduced me to Chris, who's one of my best friends, just a really genius mind in creative and total, total like messed up human, too. <laughs> but I say that in a loving way. And he would I would say this to his face. But so. That experience was awesome. Planning a show, learning the ins and outs of being in the driver's seat of a show was really, because I was a point guard at times, that was a lot of fun. Um, And that has helped me. I'm now on with 550 and I've been there for, gosh, more than five years now. And KTRS has been great to me. They paired me with Brendan Weesey, who's the sports director there, who's a total pro, has been doing it a long time. And he makes it super easy with my crazy schedule. There are times when I'm, at spring training or we're at a game and we always make it work and he's awesome and knows his stuff. So it's really fun. And I like doing radio. I do some of the morning shows, just little hits, little short hits on some of their talk shows, which are fun because they're not super detailed sports. They're more kind of big picture, which I enjoy. And then we get pretty into the weeds on the sports show in the evenings, but I think it helps me as a writer. It's cool what areas you reach, people who maybe don't read you in the print might hear you on the radio. So I think it's, I hope it's a good look for the paper and helps the, the paper's brand a little bit. And the paper is kind enough to let me do it. And the radio station understands that first and foremost, I got to got to handle the writing side. So it's been a really good partnership, but I do think it helps me with my writing because it gets me talking. Yeah. And sometimes you start talking and you stumble into an idea and you go, man, I feel strongly about that subject. Mm-hmm. No, I didn't know that I did. And the conversations you have in radio, they're not, so, they're not formulated. They're not so strict. You can free wheel it a little bit more. And I think it helps me stumble into ideas, topics that sometimes I end up writing about. So I've noticed it goes both ways. Sometimes you're on radio talking about something you wrote. Yeah. And sometimes you're on radio talking and you realize, oh, I should write that. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And that helps because that has helped me. And I think that's a good balance for me. Nice. Before I let you go, this has been great, by the way. I want to get your big, you mentioned big picture. And I want to get your thoughts on some local and regional sports things going on as we're in the thick of it, or just starting February, actually. But we'll be close to March Madness and, and pitchers and catchers reporting. But the Blues, disappointing, big picture viewpoint on the Blues. Yeah, it took lost season for them, it seems like. And we're not used to saying that yeah. here. Both the Cardinals and the Blues do such a great job of always being relevant that it's rare to have a season like this where you approach a trade deadline and feel like the best thing for one of these teams to do is sell it off. But 
I do think they're at that point, and they tried to do two things at once this season where they wanted to try to keep that contention window open, but they were also clearly pivoting toward the youth in the future with the contracts to Jordan and Robert, and it feels like now is the time to continue to move in that direction and basically sell off what you can and move this thing forward because right now they're not getting it done, and they had a chance to deliver a different message to Doug Armstrong before the break, and they delivered the opposite one. So I think he's got to lean into that. There's going to be talk about why should Army get a chance to fix it, and he's not going anywhere. Yeah. He's going to get that shot. I, I don't think there should be real pressure on Craig Baru. I guess if the young guys who need to be a good part of this team moving forward go down the tubes at the end of the season, they got a lot of hockey left to play. Right. Even And it should be presented as you guys have a chance to be a part of the future of this team. Go show it. If he loses that group, then maybe. But I really think it's Army's mess to clean up. I think he deserves a chance to fix it, and I think he's got to – He's got to sell off what they can and try to get some draft picks, try to get some young talent and try to start to lean forward into what is the next kind of contention era of the Blues going to look like. And trying to thread that needle is hard. They tried and it didn't work for them. Cardinals, we've got spring training is going to be here before we know it. Transition happening. We've got no more Yadier Molina, no more Albert Pujols. So weird. One more year of Adam Wainwright, new catcher in Wilson Contreras. What do you think? What's the, uh, of course, the division is they've got all the opportunity there, but baseball fans of St. Louis, we want more than just the central division a title. What do you think? I think they're a good team, probably better than some of the fans are giving them credit for because they were understandably frustrated after how the offseason developed after the Contreras signing. But I think they're a good team. I don't think they're as good of a team as they could have been. And I think they would agree with that, but they agree with it with an optimistic stance. And some of the Cardinals fans are like agreeing with it with a negative stance. And I get it. I mean, John Mozilla entered the offseason talking about this payroll that was going to go up. And I think people got ideas based off of that. And while it technically did go up, it was not – people were expecting more than just a catcher. And they got a good one in Contreras. I, I like that signing a lot. And then they looked around at the market, and I think they felt like the prices were – not prices they couldn't beat or match, but prices they didn't want to. And I think that was twofold. I think one was because they, they didn't like the prices, and two, because they liked some of the guys on their team maybe as much as some of the options that were out there. So – I thought they needed to add another starting pitcher. They are saying that they still could as the season goes along, though they'll have the trade deadline. But one of the things that's really clear is they're kind of doubling down on a lot of these guys who they think can come through, whether it's Tyler O'Neill or Dylan Carlson, not Paul DeYoung so much because he's not a starter, but they've still got him. They didn't rush to trade him at a loss. They've created these opportunities for these guys who are really in make or break Time, time frame to either produce or they're going to be in trouble. It's a it's an interesting season in that sense. Um, you got John Mozeliak as of now entering the, the final season of his contract. We'll hear more about what that looks like at spring training, the Cardinals have said, but there's not a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Meanwhile, you've got two MVP finalists in Goldschmidt and Arana. Yeah. They're really needing some of these young guys to come through. They're needing guys who've been hurt to play better, and they're needing guys like Jack Flaherty, who should be very good players, to to go through and prove that. If that happens, they're going to look smart. If it doesn't, they're going to look like they stop short, and that's the stage that's set up as entering spring. They'll be the favorites to win this division. The Brewers are going to be competitive. They always are. The Cubs have gotten better. They have a group of mis- misfit toys, and maybe they come together and are really good. But uh, the Cardinals are the favorites, but what they've learned – you know what they've been. What's been proven is in this era, this expanded wild card, you can be the best team in your division and still have a, a three game wild card series right. against a team that's better. So how they adjust to this new reality is going to be the big story. As of now, they're saying their model doesn't need to change, but. I think you can cite a growing amount of evidence that suggests it does. I was going to throw the Super Bowl in there, but we know where that's going. I'm more interested in getting your thoughts on college basketball because, like you said— No, I've got a question. You said I could ask you a question. You can. Okay, all right. I want to ask you a question. What? Where are you at on— There's a big debate going on now, right now about what is a St. Louis sports fan, and can it include Chiefs fans? Are, these, are the St. Louis sports fans who've adopted the Chiefs, are they committing crime against St. Louis sports <laughs> fandom? Are they, can we allow it? I can argue it both ways. I'm pretty down on the NFL. And I, as I covered a lot of that relocation stuff pretty close, yeah. and it, it really was gross. And you can't look at the NFL the same. However, I did grow up rooting for the Chiefs because I was from Sedalia, Missouri, and that was one of the first teams I ever liked. And beyond that, you're not a fan of any team now that you've covered this stuff so long. But because of that, 
and I, you see how likable Mahomes is, and they're a good team. I can understand why some St. Louis sports fans are getting on that bandwagon. And I've heard people saying they're getting sick of the Chiefs, actually. Really, like, I was sick of Tom Brady and the Patriots, but that goes back when we had the Rams. So you're asking me, I've always been a hometown sports guy. I've always rooted for the locals. So that includes the Rams. When the Rams left, I didn't have any tie to them, so I didn't root for them. Yeah. I, didn't, I haven't had an NFL team that I'm tied into since the Rams have left. I don't mind watching the NFL. I don't have it out like some people do, like they say they don't. I can tell you that at one point, I was disappointed. My, <laughs> so I'm still an old school cable guy. I have yeah. got Netflix, but I don't have YouTube TV. I still have my standard cable. But they dropped... Red Zone channel. I loved the Red Zone network. And I did not make the effort to get it back because I don't really have a team, but that's the ease. That's the best way to watch is seeing just all the touchdowns. But I wasn't, I didn't feel the connection anymore that I need to have. I don't play fantasy football anymore. I don't have that time suck in my life. So it's just, you know what it is, whatever game's on CBS or Fox, I'll just turn it on in the background and watch. If something exciting is going on, I got it on. I can tell you, I tend to root for who I think might be quote unquote likable for me. But I think that's, I've seen that these tweets going around from some folks in the area saying, yeah, okay, St. Louis, we don't have to root for, no, you don't have to root for the Chiefs. It's fine. You root whoever you want saying, to. You must. Right. Like I, I'm born and raised in St. Louis. I will gladly admit I do not root for St. Louis University basketball, but I went to Missouri State and I've worked for the Missouri Valley Conference. I root for Missouri State and I like seeing Valley teams. I like seeing mid-majors succeeding in state tournament. Same thing. I, I, I didn't know you were a Billikens hater, man. I, I'm not a hater. I just don't root for Breaking them. Breaking news on the uh, podcast here. If, if the, I, I pick and choose. Put it that way. If Put it this way. I, and I was going to ask you about this. I saw a NCAA, and we're getting that time of year where there's bracket projections all over the place. Not not Lenardi, but Jerry Palm, CBS, had a bracket out there. I believe it was him that had a number five Mizzou team see playing a number 12 St. Louis University team. <laughs> and and me up. And absolutely sign me up too. But I have no idea who I'd root for as the Missouri State guy. Because as the Missouri State guy, I don't care how bad the Bears are. I want, I'd want. love to see us get the Billikens back on the schedule. Win or lose, whatever. There was a time we were playing on a regular basis. We haven't played Missouri State or we haven't played Mizzou since 1998, I believe. We did win that game. But that's not a game that's going to happen. I feel the slew games were attainable, but I don't know if those coaches will ever agree to play. So My dream scenario is like a cross- it was like a Missouri and Illinois tournament. Oh, it'd be great. Build out around the Bragging Rights game that includes like Missouri State, that includes the Valley, and you play everybody. And it's yeah. like a round robin. Like you don't play everybody every year, but like you, you make the Bragging Rights game, Mizzou versus Illinois, and you build it out into one of those little invitationals. Yeah. You round robin all of the area teams. And it would help the, it would help, you know, the Missouri States and it would help the Illinois States. It would help them improve their strength of schedule greatly. Yeah. And it, to me, that's the kind of stuff that should be mandatory. Yeah. That should have to happen instead of playing. Nobody's ever heard of Western university <laughs> as your buy game, yeah. you play those games and actually give fans in the area something to look forward to. Yeah. If I were the commissioner of college sports at large, that would be one of my, <laughs> I like it my changes. And I would also make, that's part of the reason I would love to see, Missouri and SLU play. I get so tired annually of this. Who's wrong for Missouri and SLU not playing each other? They're both wrong. Right. It's a game that people want to see. They should play it, period. It'd be, be sold out it. wherever yeah. it is because college fit. basketball, it's the biggest problem. And it's getting better about this, I think, is not being relevant early enough. Yeah. And people ignore it until March. I do think they've gotten better at that with some of the big events they play. But playing regional rivalries, playing games that make sense, playing games people want to see – College coaches want to talk about how people need to pay attention sooner to college basketball in the season. Play more games that, that, that matter. Yes, yes. I think that would be one of them. Mizzou wanted to play SLU in a – I think they wanted like a two-for-one. It was like two games at Mizzou, one at SLU. And sure. SLU was like, that's not fair. And it's like you really wanted to play, you'd take it. And if Mizzou really wanted to play, then they would have offered a one-and-one. One. So blame can go whatever, yeah. whatever ways. But I do think the fact that people want to see games – and they don't. It's not good for the product. That's why I actually commend Missouri, Kansas, and Illinois for playing basketball every year again now because 
whether they're in the SEC or not, the Mizzou students chant, and I won't say it, you know what, KU yeah. at every home basketball game, it's still real, and it's back now that they're playing again. So you can't ignore that stuff. It's part of what makes college sports awesome. Yeah, I think the one thing for me, <clears throat> and I'm using this in a college sports lens just because of my eight years working at the Valley, but when we hosted NCAA tournament events, and you've covered you've covered Arch Madness, you've covered the NCAA events here, but especially in the St. Louis region, again, this is my hometown, a guy that's... I, I love rooting for the small guy in college basketball, but for the region and for the sports commission, the Valley slew to host games here when our area teams are good and they move the needle, it generates interest. And that helps us get things like the regionals, potential final fours in St. Louis. Um, the last time I was on staff at the Valley and we hosted, it was, a t- it was a down year for local area basketball. Illinois wasn't great. Mizzou definitely wasn't great. And SLU was just, and so it's like you're trying to push tickets. No one's, the local fans are like, I'm going to wait to see who's coming. Kansas coming? Is there a big dog coming? Is Carolina coming? And then I'll go. When there's interest that you might see a really good Mizzou team get a home cooking game here in St. Louis in a second round or a regional, man, they get excited. So from that standpoint for me, that kind of stuff matters. Matters. And now back as being the fan, not that I, not behind that college sports curtain anymore, just being able to root. I love to see those opportunities for the fan, but also knowing that it can drive interest. Just like you say, it would sell tickets. It get people out there, not just watch on TV, but in the building to see it. I'm hopeful this year because, you know, at least in terms of Illinois, Mizzou and SLU being relevant, that's helpful. Potentially all three of them playing postseason basketball. And in the Valley, anything's going to happen because it's a nutty year. Right now, there are like six teams within first place. And it's this a, a, an anomaly of a year where everyone's not great, but you know what? Come St. Louis with a new look Valley, all 12 teams, Murray State, Belmont adding some juice, their fans coming. It's going to make Arch Madness a little bit more crazy because everyone knows it's a one bid Valley this year. And it's yeah. going to make the tournament all that hotter. And the league race this year has been that much nuttier. So honestly, I told someone this. You can easily say it. out of the 12 teams, 10 teams could be anybody else in the Missouri Valley this year. So it's going to make Arch Madness all that easy or that more interesting, I should say, which in turn should make college basketball for the remainder of the region in terms of Mizzou, SLU and Illinois, all that more interesting as we head into March. So Arch Madness is the kickoff to the best part of college basketball season. It's not close. Last year, the silver lining for me of the lockout, the baseball lockout, was I'm usually I usually miss Arch Madness. Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Spring training. And I was able to cover all of it. Yeah. Because I got to cover it from start to finish and I loved it. Brian Burwell, you know, it Brian Burwell, Burwell taught me a lot of things and I was honored to know him back from when I was an intern and a student at Mizzou. And one of the things he really taught me was never underestimate Arch Madness. He loved <laughs> it. And you can see why. The stories, the players, it's a it's college basketball at its best and it gets that early stage before yeah. the lights flicker on everywhere else so that was a, it's always a blast to cover i gotta start working out my spring training schedule better where i don't miss it every year <laughs> but, uh, yeah i gotta that's a good reminder for figuring that out this year but i'm with you man college basketball has been i feel like spending in a lot of ways it's been like spending the 40 days in the desert since i got back and i feel like we're coming out of it mizzou, yeah mizzou is looking like a team that maybe could win a tournament game dare I say, for the first time since Mike Anderson was there. SLU is is not in as good a shape after losing to Fordham, but A-10 is totally up in the air, and somebody's got to go from that league, and we'll see if somebody can stir the at-large, the automatic qualifier spot, but you've got to the at large spot other than the automatic qualifier, but somebody's got to win that tournament. Right. And why couldn't the Billikens in Illinois after and Illinois is doing what they always do, where they show up to bragging rights game and they look like a team that doesn't belong in the room. And then by the end of the year, they figure it out much dangerous. The yeah. Underwoods guys get better as the year goes along. So it would be awesome to have multiple multiples of those teams in the tournament and then whoever grabs that spot out of the Valley. I do feel like regionally, and I love college hoops, Regionally, I feel like we're turning the corner here, which is awesome. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so myself. Like I said, it's for me, it's my number one sport. I love watching college basketball. And we're about yeah, a month on, out. So. Come on the big sports show with Weesey and I some night. With, hey. Uh, the, the Valley's on. Yeah, he's a friend of the Valley. So I, I got to know him when they came on board. on one of these nights. Yeah, I got to know him when they came on board as the radio partner with the Valley. My One of my last two years or so, and they do a weekly show talking about all things of Valley. No, he's a good guy, and I'm glad you're on with him, and they uh, do awesome stuff. So I hope that partnership with the Valley and 550 lasts for a while because – 
for them to have a radio home in St. Louis also matters because coverage, like I said, a guy that did the social media and a little bit of media coverage for the Missouri Valley, I know how much that helps. Uh, it's not just one weekend in March. It's a, a full conference season. So I'm glad that's partnerships working out well for them. And hopefully I can keep that going. Let the folks know where they can follow you on social media and read your stuff and all that good stuff. <laughs> I'm hard to get away from. <laughs> Sorry if I'm annoying anybody, but obviously stltoday.com and the pages of the Post Dispatch. On Twitter at Ben underscore Fred. There's a Facebook page and all that stuff now that, that we're doing. I've got a new newsletter that I'll plug. We've, we've, we're leaning into the newsletters and have had good responses for those at the paper. You can sign up for it at stltoday.com slash newsletters and just click a box there and it'll get sent to you. I'm not a spammer. It only goes out once a week, <laughs> but uh, it recaps the chat that we do at stltoday.com and gives me an avenue to get into some other things that that don't make the columns as well. So if folks are interested in any of that, I appreciate them checking out. And thanks for giving me the chance to come on and, and catch up and plug that stuff. No, I appreciate you taking time, man. This has been great. Didn't expect to go 55 minutes, That's but right. uh, it's all good. I appreciate you taking time and keep up the great work, man. It's been tremendous. I know you and Hockman came in and there was a little bit of shift replacing some folks, but the quote unquote new blood has been keeping that train rolling there. And it's exciting to see you guys bring some new and unique things to the paper and doing what you do best. Hey, keeping us informed. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And the plan is to continue to do that. So we'll keep grinding away and encourage folks following along. Thanks for listening to this episode of Persons of Interest. This podcast is a personal project with the goal of sharing stories that might inspire others to create their own path. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. If you have a guest suggestion, you can reach Derek on Twitter at ddocket. This has been Persons of Interest.